Thank you, Anne. Thanks everybody for having me. Amen. It's the first time I've um, given a talk, given a sermon. And I want to tell you um, a bit about my journey with the Lord. It's been a long, difficult and emotional sort of a year or two lately. But before I do that, I just want to say something about this church. I've, I know you've, you've seen me before briefly when I come and stay with Paul. i uh, seen my son Manu, who's unfortunately not here today. He's actually gone the other way, he's gone back to our place. Uh, ironically, that wasn't that well planned, but never mind. Um, Thank you, Alan, for asking me. This place you, you've made is just extraordinary. This church you're building. I've been to so many churches. I've been to church for so long, decades and decades. And I can tell you from my experience, you have something special here. Alan and Jackie have made this a place of, of just great holiness and just a place where people can come and, and be free and, and be set free from so many things through the love of Jesus and, and the power of Jesus that we've just sung about. And I just want to thank you so much. Um, if anybody had said to me, you know, be preaching in a year's time, a year ago, I, I, would, I wouldn't have believed it. But, uh, but here I am. I, I want to tell you a little bit about the, the last year or so. And, and really, the subject God gave me was immediate. When Paul said, uh, oh, you know, I know you just met Alan, but he's actually thinking of asking you to preach. I thought, ah, really? Um, and I said to the Lord, I said, what should I talk on? And immediately I heard that, that word that, that Jesus gives, and it's backed up by Paul in the epistle, be anxious for nothing. It's like a command. It's not in the commandments, but it, perhaps it ought to be the... the the 11th or the 13th, depending on what commentaries you read about commandments. But it's a, it's a tough thing to speak on because it's ironic because I, I probably have been in my life at various times the most anxious person I know. Uh, I come from a, <laughs> a Christian background, but a, an anxious Christian background. And um, I sort of, apart from the title, Be Anxious for Nothing, I, I've subtitled this uh, Fear of Public Speaking versus walking in my godly destiny so um anyway i i want to i want to tell you where i've been for the last year and and some background about who i am really before i before you wonder who it is that's standing talking to you here and, and how i got here um i grew up in a christian family i got saved at age 11 prior to going to grammar school um i'd been taken on uh, evangelical christian holidays Heard the gospel preached, and um, it, it, it hit me that I wasn't saved. It hit me that if, if I died as a child, I wasn't going to heaven. On reflection, I think the Holy Spirit had, had convicted me of my sin, had, and I struggled with this, if I'm honest. I, I was unable to sleep. I, I would read the Bible every night from sort of age 10 through age 11 and until the point it came and I was anxious about going to grammar school. This was a big move. It is for any kid to go from primary to secondary school. And I guess I'd reached a point where I needed to make a decision. And I went to my mum and we prayed and, and it, it was great. A great sense of peace came upon me. I accepted Jesus into my heart at that age. And I, I went to school. I went to school. I did okay. I, I always struggled with telling people about my faith. I hid it, actually. It was quite funny. I joined the Christian Union, but I would go and uh, sneakily hide in the hallway outside the room that it was held in school and sort of hop between the columns to make sure nobody saw me going in. Um, Christian coward, I suppose, at that time. Um, I found it tough. I, I, I suppose, you know, even then I was struggling with what came to fruition about a year ago. But um, four years passed on, uh, 15 years of age, I, I got baptised in a Baptist church by total immersion. It was absolutely freezing, stone cold church, no, no heating, um, incredible experience. 
the, the minister was a footballer as well, which kind of made it cool for me. I thought, you can get baptised by a footballer. And that's, he played for the local non-league side at centre forward. And um, again, I, I kind of struggled with telling people about it. Um, and I suppose I, I'd, I struggled for confidence. I, I, I remember taking my exams and, and feeling really under pressure and, and passing out a couple of times, really under the stress of, of anxiety. I was always aware of what Jesus said about it. We, we read it many times. These are familiar passages we're going to read very shortly. Um, but it was a struggle. By age 20, I'd, I'd moved to London for work. And um, I went to church a couple of times. Tried different places. Always aware that... You know, I, I needed to follow Jesus. I needed to back up my commitment that I had made at both the age of 11 and, and 15. But I lacked the courage to do it on, on reflection. And although I knew it was a huge mistake, I, at the age of 20, 21, I walked away from the church. In the end, for a total of about 17 years. And I always knew that I think like most prodigals that I would come back, the Lord was always in my heart. I still prayed. But I didn't walk with God. I remember um, I joined a church in, in Croydon that was run by a, a chap who used to be the bassist in Eric Clapton's band because I figured that was about the coolest church I could find in my area. I suppose I was trying to sort of make Christianity cool in my own mind when I, I perceived that all my friends didn't think it was. I was desperately anxious of what people would think about me. And I remember having a good prayer session with Dave one afternoon when I'd gone to see him one on one. And he said to me, you know, do, do you want to walk with Jesus or you, know, you, you need to decide what you're doing? And sadly, I walked away. I remember walking down the street, I had a snooker cue in my hand, a kind of symbol of misspent youth rather than a Bible. And I didn't really, I didn't do anything about it much in terms of my Christian walk for, for several years. But as I said, I always knew I'd come back. I think all prodigals do when they walk away. And, and as I went to sort of uh, make a lot of mistakes. In the year 2001, this, this kind of odyssey ended. I'd got married um, to my lovely wife, Christine, who's yeah, named after Christ. God keeps dropping me these hints along the way. <laughs> um, and the responsibility of bringing up children just made me realise that I had to get real. I had to walk with the Lord. I had to be an example. I had to walk out all I knew about Jesus and, and, and the narrow path and, and not follow the wide road that I'd taken. And I had to make some big decisions. I had a, a business with a, a friend of mine at the time. I wasn't doing it right. I, I was running it crooked. Um, I'd been doing wrong things financially for a long time. So I, I gave that up. <coughs> that was a burden I had to work through for several years afterwards. Uh, with various friends helping. And I, I recommitted to the pastor at the time at my church back in Hertfordshire, in, in, in Berkhamstead, in, in North Church Baptist Church. Four years later, after giving that job up and, and getting some more work, I went personally bankrupt. I, we lost everything. I paid the price, if you will, I think, for my, my walk away. And that still affects our financial position on paper today. But I know what the Bible says about money. And uh, maybe that's another sermon another time. I am a work in progress at the moment. But throughout all of this time, I had really struggled in my working life with making ends meet and, and walking. I, I'd ask God so many times, what do you want me to do for work? I, I, I never felt a vocation. I never felt a calling to do anything in particular. I drifted from one mini career in a state agency into project management. And, and for a long time, I, I struggled with that. And I had a prophecy. I went to Glasgow once to meet some strange people in a big prophecy organization that's connected with some people like Bill Heyman, prophets who you may have read books on for years. And they, they said to me at that time, 
I was in a terrible place, really, mentally. Uh, they said to me, green fields are coming. There's going to be some open space, some, some time of blessing, some time of release. So I thought, wow, you know, I'm so grateful for that because I was becoming more and more desperate, really, in, in, in my walk at work. And I think it affected quite badly my home life, too. So I took that on board, and I, about three, four years later, I came across a job that I just thought, this is perfect, this is the most amazing company to work for. Um, it seemed to be what I had aspired to, working client-side in project management, rather than working for a consultancy, as I'd mostly done. But I was shocked to find that, in spite of this prophecy, and this word over me, that things it didn't go as well as I'd hoped. I had a, a difficult boss. He used to call himself a horrible boss. He referred to himself as a horrible boss. And I struggled. I struggled to uh, to please him, I suppose, on, on reflection. And, and the relationship became difficult. The market turned, lockdown hit. And to cut that difficult story short, the second lockdown, I, I lost my job. I'd lost my job, and in the financial position we're in, the age I'm at, that's a difficult thing to do. I remember, as I work in construction project management, a colleague of mine years ago said, "Yeah, past the age of 50, you won't get any work." You know, this is a bad word spoken over men. I remembered that, and throughout this time, I had prayed and I had prayed, and God reassured me, Jesus reassured me personally that it was going to be okay. That no matter what happened, that we were always going to be provided for, and I, and I clung on to that in my head, but my, my heart was broken. Um, I was devastated, really, really devastated. I'd, during the time, just before I left that company, I, I turned to doctors and, and they put me on some medication. They put me on medication for anxiety, ostensibly, but I'd, during the previous struggle that I've, I've sort of talked about a little bit a minute ago, I, I'd also had a couple of bouts of, of depression coinciding with bereavement, and I asked my father-in-law, and then my father, sort of eight years apart. And that was hard. And I found myself for a third time on pretty heavy medication. And I felt bad. We all know that it's impossible to please God without faith. I felt that my faith had been hit hard. I was a broken man in many ways. I wasn't hopeless. The, the, the hope of Jesus was always there as a sort of dim light in the distance from where I was sitting. So I, I took some time out. These were difficult times. I took a little time out. I didn't look for a job for another four to six weeks, really. Um, I cried out to God. And he kept saying, no, it, it, it's going to be okay. I kept hearing that. But it, it was difficult. I find it difficult even to talk about it now, even a year later. I'd worked so hard to get where I got, and, and yet there seemed at the end to be just this, this nothingness, this loss, this sense of loss of path, this sense of loss of purpose. Um, a bit like Peter walking on the water, I suppose. I looked down. I, I looked down at the dark water, the possibility of not being able to get a job easily again, of not being able to keep our, ourselves going financially. Um, it, it was a tough one, a really, really tough one. Um, I looked at something David wrote in, in Psalm 55. And this kind of sums up the kind of prayer I suppose I was, uh, I was praying at the time. It, it says, listen to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my supplication. Attend to me and answer me. I am restless and distraught in my complaint and must moan. This is the amplified version. I like to moan. And I'm distracted at the noise of the enemy because of the oppression and the threats of the wicked. For they would cast trouble upon me. In wrath they would persecute me. My heart is grievously pained within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling have come upon me, horror and fright have, have overwhelmed me, and I say, oh, that I had wings of a dove, and I would fly away and be at rest.
Like a lot of people that, that struggle with depression at different times of life, Alan mentioned it earlier that he too has suffered. Um, I, I wouldn't say I contemplated suicide, I, I fantasized about it. I would never leave my kids, I would never leave my wife. But man, that was the hardest time ever. But I am here because God has miraculously resurrected my career. I have a good job with people that aren't horrible. I haven't found one yet. Not even amongst the clients. And that says something special. The, the, the Glasgow prophecy of the green fields, the spacious place, the place of blessing just wasn't where I first spotted it, I guess. You know, it was a it was a process, and just when I thought I'd been tested to the limit through bankruptcy and the, the three sort of depressed times, it, it there came more. And, and and sometimes God's like that. Sometimes the walk is long and hard. But I'm here to say, don't give up. Never give up. If you've got a friend, a family. In this situation, just keep bringing Jesus. Amen. Keep bringing Jesus. Amen. Keep praying as you do. Your prayers for Ukraine today are just incredible. Absolutely incredible. And what you're seeing happening is just amazing. I should have um, I should have warned you that you know, I'm extremely emotional. I, I find it very hard to to talk about things of the heart and to watch other people doing the same without without crying it's don't worry it's partly the joy of the lord and the grace of god it's not that i'm still in that place you know i am i come here medication free but i should have brought some tissues hallelujah <laughs> marek's gonna get some tissues right. uh, i already have one <laughs> no that's cool, man. That's cool man. Yeah, yeah. stop blubbing now hopefully we'll read some scripture so that, that's my journey. Um, I want to read for you, read with you, read with me if you like. Open your Bibles, click your devices. Matthew 6, where Jesus talks about what I am working through. That, you know, to be anxious for nothing. He says, therefore, I tell you, stop. Stop being perpetually uneasy, anxious and worried about your life, what you shall eat, what you should drink, or about your body, what you should put on. Is not life greater in quality than food and the body far above and more excellent than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father keeps feeding them. And are you not more than they. And here's a verse I've, I've thought about a lot. Verse 27. And who of you by worrying and being anxious can add one unit of measure to his stature? Well, I sure don't need that. I'm six foot four and this mic's a bit too low even now. Um, but here's another one. Or to the span of his life. Why should you be anxious about clothes? Consider the lilies of the field and learn thoroughly how they grow. They neither tall nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his magnificence, excellence, dignity and grace was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and green and tomorrow is tossed into the furnace, will he not much more surely clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. <laughs> I'm preaching to myself there a year ago. He says it again. Therefore, do not worry and be anxious, saying, what are we going to eat? Or what are we going to have to drink? Or what are we going to wear? For the Gentiles, or heathen, wish for and crave and diligently seek all these things. And your heavenly Father knows well that you need them all. But seek, aim at, Strive after, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right.
And then all these things taken together will be given to you besides. All these things that you've worried about will be given to you. It's guaranteed in the word. A third time, he says, verse 34, do not worry or be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have worries and anxieties all of its own. Sufficient for each day is its own trouble. I think it's massively significant that Jesus says it three times in a, in a short speech, if you will, a, a short few verses, do not worry. The Bible's got a lot of threes in it, the most obvious one being the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a sort of completeness about the three there. Perhaps the worst example, Peter's three denials. He, he broke his heart and, and it, it kind of completed that process that Jesus had prophesied. It's natural in our flesh to be anxious and we have some good reasons, you know, wars around, COVID. We prayed about cancer today, you know, it, it's always around the corner. We always know somebody that has it. Matthew Henry, a Bible concordance writer from the 1700s, says this, and I quote, There is scarcely any sin against which our Lord Jesus more warns his disciples than disquieting, distracting, distrustful cares about the things of this life. This often ensnares the poor as much as the love of wealth does the rich. But there's a carefulness about temporal things which is a duty, though we must not carry these lawful cares too far. What he's saying is, you know, we have to get a job, we have to work. We have to provide for families, we have to give. But don't worry about how you get there. I, I will show you the way. You will fall over. Perhaps in my case, through disobedience. But even if you walk in, I've also found the struggles that come. Each day sure does have its own trouble, never more. I think in our time than in the last few months and years. Amen. But there are some promises I want to read you as well. John 15 verse 7 says in, in this respect, If you live in me, abide vitally united to me, and my words remain in you, and continue to live in your hearts, Ask whatever you will and it'll be done for you. What a promise. I admired the courage of the prayers earlier about healing of cancer. I, 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 we prayed here today according to the word. Not according to our experience. Not according to what the NHS, the NHS says about health and the state of our health and the state of the world. We prayed according to Isaiah 53. A few years ago, I joined the church prayer ministry and people often come forward for healing and, and I, would, I would read this scripture for them and over them and declare it over them. Isaiah says, surely he, Jesus, has borne our griefs sicknesses, weaknesses, and distresses, and carried our sorrows and pains of punishment, yet we ignorantly considered him stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God as if with leprosy. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt and iniquities. The chastisement, that punishment needful to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him. And with the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. Thank you, Jesus. Help us to receive that by faith. Isaiah 55 says that we don't have to earn or deserve it. 
come by blessing with your heart so that it can be filled. I quote, yes, come, buy, price of spiritual wine and milk without money, without price, simply for the self-surrender that accepts the blessing. I found that anxiety can make me angry, make me aggressive. I've also come to realise that the, the Bible is not some spiritual diet book that you refer to from time to time when the struggles are there. It's something that you walk in. 17 years in the wilderness sure showed me that. You walk in daily, and the more you walk, the more you have to give others. Your friends, your family, your people at work. We all know we need to walk on the narrow path. It's hard. But we are, as a people of God, soaked in his loving kindness. There's a Hebrew word for it called Hasid. It's a, it means that God is, by the covenant of Jesus' blood, obligated to bless, obligated to give, in abundance, obligated to be our Father, our Father of unfathomable love, who sacrificed his Son to set us free from sin. Proverbs 12 says in verse 25, anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down. But an encouraging word makes it glad. I've noticed how you people, we, I'm half in half, half, half out here, I'm half in half and showing half in Manchester, but you, you, you encourage each other. You know, you, you always do it. I hear it in little conversations as I get to know some of you. It's just such a pleasure. It's just such a blessing to me. Let's always do that. Let us encourage each other. Amen. My mate Dave, the minister back home at my church, always says, be an adder, an adder of things, good things of God to people. Don't say anything that takes anything away from them. The effects of anxiety have a a profound, and I found this myself, a negative influence on our lives. The Harvard School of Medicine says, and this is interesting, it's not biblical, but I found it really interesting, that everybody experiences pain at some point. But in people with depression or anxiety, pain can become particularly intense and hard to treat. People suffer from, suffering from depression, for example, tend to experience more severe and long-lasting pain than other people. The overlap of anxiety, depression, and pain is particularly evident in chronic and sometimes disabling pain syndromes, such as fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, low back pain, headaches, and nerve pain. For example, about two thirds of patients with irritable bowel syndrome who are referred for follow-up care have symptoms of psychological distress most often anxiety. About 65% of patients seeking help from depression also report at least one type of pain symptom. Psychiatric disorders not only contribute to pain intensity, but also to the increased risk of disability. Researchers once thought the reciprocal relationship between pain anxiety and depression resulted mainly from psychological rather than biological factors. Chronic pain is depressing. And likewise, major depression may feel physically painful. But as researchers have learned more about how the brain works and how the nervous system interacts with other parts of the body, they've discovered that pair shares some of the biological mechanisms with anxiety and depression. Shared anatomy contributes 
to some of this interplay. I'm going to take a drink here because we've got some long words coming. Bear with me, I'm not medically experienced in any way, but the somosensory cortex, part of the brain that interprets sensations such as touch, interacts with the amygdala and the hypothalamus and the anterior cingulate gyrus, I'm getting there in a minute, don't worry, areas that regulate emotions and the stress response to generate mental and physical experience of pain. These same regions also contribute to anxiety and depression. See there, you see, even the, the secular world has, has proved Jesus wise and true. There's, there's no argument in favor of anxiety, of keeping hold of it, you know. We hear those phrases, you know, anxious to please, worried you should be. It's just not right. It's a difficult command, but command it is nonetheless. Before I close, I just want to add something. I've not actually written this down, but I want to read um, from Psalm 91. I came across this the best part of 20 years ago, um, shortly after that 2001 year, my reconversion, as I call it. And it's just incredible. Um, I remember printing it out. I was in an office. I printed it out because one of the kids at church was diagnosed with meningitis and it was terminal. And he was in a hospital at Hemel Hempstead. And I gave this print out to the prayer team at the time. I, I would just join the church a short time before. Um, and I said, that's the word of God on that. Take it to the hospital. Take the word. Incredibly, within, within about a day or two, somebody recounted the conversation of the, the two consultants who were looking at each other gobsmacked while little Matthew was alive and well and showing no symptoms of meningitis. They looked at each other and they said, do, 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 we were sure it was meningitis, weren't we? And they were sort of a bit worried in case they looked like they'd misdiagnosed it. But they both agreed, these two top consultants, they both checked, the doctors had checked, it was definitely meningitis. And it had gone. It had gone. Psalm 91 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. It's hard to find a secret place. Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely He'll deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. Perhaps I should have stuck with the amplified, that's a tricky word, perilous pestilence. Disease. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you'll take refuge. His truth shall be a shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence, the disease that stalks in the darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Now listen to this, verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side, mm -hmm. ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Mm -hmm. Only with your eyes, I find this hard, this verse, but only with your eyes should you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you've made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you. Mm -hmm. This is incredible stuff. <clears throat> Nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Amen. For he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Amen. In their hands, they will bear you up. Some of you might remember Satan stealing that and using it in the temptation of Christ. He knows it's true. He tried to twist it and use it for his own purpose. Here's a little one. 
lest you dash your foot against the stone. He cares that much. I remember being delivered from constantly stubbing my toe. I was clumsy around the house. It, 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 really weirdly, I used to constantly damage my toes walking around the house with no shoes on, and it suddenly stopped. Perhaps after I read this, I can't really remember. It's the, the most trivial healing of one of many that I've, I've experienced through Jesus. But I just suddenly thought of that. It is quite funny. It goes on. You'll tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You'll trample underfoot. Mm -hmm. And here's what God says. Because he has set his love, or she, upon me, therefore I will deliver him or her. I will set him or her on high. <laughs> because he's known my name. Because she's known my name. She, he will call upon me. And I will answer them. I'll be with them in trouble. I will deliver them. I'll honour them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Praise God. It's just not... There's no more we need than that, is there really? I'll say this about the war. It's a horrendous thing. Whatever you think about the politics of it, But I have heard from numerous churches, I think you've had some of this, um, information from Christian people inside the Ukraine that say, we see the rockets coming, but they divert, they don't arrive. We see the tanks coming, but the Russian soldiers are lost. They've run out of food and they're asking for directions. Amen. The news will show you the devastation and destruction. It will not show you the people of God that are being delivered according to this. This psalm was written thousands of years before weapons of mass destruction. Just so long before. It, it was written really for this time. So let's not be anxious. I know it's easy to say, but you know, it, it's, it's the logical conclusion from reading the word that you come to. Why is that? Because we have the mind of Christ. And if we waver and think we don't, then we read the word again. We go back to the word. We declare the word over us. Paul and I were blessed yesterday to have a visit from Peggy. She's bringing any biscuits. An amazing daughter of Abraham. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely amazing. And... and <laughs> She's an example of what I'm talking about here. She's an example of what God's talking about. We all are, by faith. We all are. We have to be. We don't grade ourselves on levels. We're not elite Christians or beginners. Or We're all influenced by the Holy Spirit. We can do amazing things through us. We have the mind of Christ. How are we for time? Ten minutes. Wrap up. <laughs> I'll just say three little things I've got to say. Alan knows this. I've told him this on, but Psalm 91. There was a town in Texas during the World War II that lost all its men to the Allied invasion. The American troops were in France and Germany. They'd all gone. Everybody had been called up. And the women used to meet to pray in the morning. Every single man, every single man in that small town came back from the front. Every single man. Mm. Vietnam platoon commander, similar. Every drill, every morning, he made them read Psalm 91. Everyone came back. Even recently during one of the Gulf Wars, I read an account of a Christian American soldier that had watched the tracer fire forming an arc around a column of American troops or whatever you think of the invasion. They formed a column, because God's word is you know, for anybody. They formed a column, uh, and they were driving down this road. They were fired up from a bridge, and the tracer fire went round them like an arc. Nothing hit.
I'm just going to finish by reading Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. To our God and Father be glory. Amen. Forever and ever. Amen. And all the people said, Amen. 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 Can I have one minute just to pray? Is that right? <laughs> Sorry, I, I wasn't sure how long it would take. But, um, Father, I just want to thank you for this place. I just want to pray uh, a blessing on this place. I want to thank you, Father, and Jackie, and all the guys here. And I pray that they, we will go from strength to strength Amen. in power and authority. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Can we just pray for Pablo? Yeah, come. No, we just can all pray. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, no, thank you. Then. You know what went straight through my mind then? Something you raised me up. So I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to be more, to be more than I can be. I sing in a band that I want to perform that song for oh, so Jesus. long. Oh, shall I for so you? long. Jesus. Um, and that's what I just feel. You know, that's the story of your He's raised you up. He's raised us all up. Oh, um, Josh Groban. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, love Josh Groban. But yeah, he's raised us. He's raised us all up to, to be more, and you're going to go on to be even more. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Just let we thank you for coming, Lord. Lord, we thank you for His bravery to stand there and share with us everything He's shared. And Lord, there's so much blessing in that. There's so many blessings in sharing the testimony. The testimony to what God has done for you and God's glory. Amen. So Lord, we ask you to pour out your grace, your love, Amen. and all the fruit of the Spirit, Lord God, Amen. in pass, pour it out abundantly. You. May he receive it. May he walk on it. A shower of your blessings, Lord God, as he goes from day to day, month to month, year to year. Father, and just may you do what Jesus you said, immeasurably more than he did. Because he is with the Father and the Spirit is with you. And we claim that for him, Lord God, right now. In Jesus' name. He will do immeasurably more. Immeasurably more mm -hmm. through Christ Jesus for his glory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 I just, um, when I was speaking as well, thank you for reading this chapter 4. Um,